Um, hello, everyone. Thank you for coming along. I'm going to start the first half of the presentation, then Annie will pick up in the second. And um, yes, we too would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land and pay our respects, but also pay our respects on this important week to people affected by and living with hepatitis C and B. So, uh, some of you might be very familiar with this picture, which is the hepatitis C treatment cascade in Australia. So this is courtesy of the Kirby Institute. So we can see here that, um, it's a little bit blurry, but in the, the left-hand side we have the estimates of people living with hepatitis C. Then we see a little bit of a drop-off, about 80% of those living with are estimated to have been diagnosed with hepatitis C. And then a further drop-off to for people who ha ever have had treatment for hepatitis C. And then the last uh, set of columns is those who have achieved a cure for hepatitis C. Now this was up until 2015. And in 2016, we saw the introduction of universal access for a new generation of hepatitis C treatments, which are way more effective and way more tolerable than the previous generation. So this picture will undoubtedly change when it's updated for uh, 2016. But what this graph tells us is that testing is high, that 80% of people expected to be estimated to be living with hepatitis C have been diagnosed, but treatment at the moment is low. But what we want to do is interrogate what might be hidden behind these, these graphs. So this is the uh, up until September 2016 dates, uh, numbers for how many people who've been treated. So in previous to 2016, between two and 3,000 people had treatment for hepatitis C each year. The first six months of 2016, when treatment access was available for everyone, that number blew out to achieve something like 30,000 people treated for hepatitis C in the, in the first nine months of access to new generation treatment. So this is remarkable. But it doesn't mean that the work of hepatitis C is done. We can pack up our things and go home. So we want to ask, follow these data and ask questions like, will the numbers plateau over time? What further work is there to achieve absolutely everybody who needs treatment getting it? So that asks, leads us to ask, who's missing out on treatment at the moment who could be benefiting from it? How are these um, new generation treatments being communicated to those at risk or needing treatment? So in terms of the theme of today, practical justice, we wanted to ask some key questions. What's not in the cascade that we really do need to be looking at? Not just diagnosis and treatment and cure rates, but other things important to the experience of living with hepatitis C. Similarly, what might be hidden within these figures? Who's missing out? Will the advent of DAAs cure this cascade? And I'm sorry, that air condition is really <coughs> drying out my throat. So rather than cough into the microphone, I might just take a little sip of water. Mm. So I don't deafen anybody who might be listening later. What else is there to consider beyond cure in the new generation of treatments? And how to do this without uh, directly making the responsibility for achieving uh, good cure rates only to be a burden of people living with hepatitis C. Lots of the hepatitis C social research has been quite consumed with ensuring that the responsibility for this virus is shared by governments, by services, and by people living with or affected by hepatitis C. That the burden of responsibility doesn't only fall on people who are affected by or at risk of hepatitis C. So we need to, in this new generation of treatments, ensure that that gaze of responsibility is directed upwards to what is it that our societal institutions should be doing to ensure that uh, hepatitis C treatments are available to everyone who requires them and not just be a, a pathological response that we need to encourage or give more knowledge to people at the end user point of view. And we want to use methods that places the lived experience in central to this. And this is the part of the reason why we have Annie working on this uh, project. And she can explain in more detail later on. So what's not in the cascade? Some key thoughts to uh, put in here is the awareness of treatments. We don't current, currently measure who knows about treatments and what they know. We don't know and we, can't, we don't measure how we communicate about care and treatment options. 
with those at risks, risk, with those who are key referral points, GPs, drug and alcohol clinics. We don't know where and how what to be best do this and we don't measure or communicate very well about where to refer to for testing on population scale. And of course these things we need to be looking at variations across key issues. Are women doing as well as men in this picture in the cascade? What about minority groups within the group of people living with hepatitis C? By disease status and those with more complex needs, are they achieving treatment at the same rates as those without those complex needs? What else might be hidden in these figures? The testing on that cascade graph showed that testing was high, but a study from Victoria published last year showed ongoing concerns regarding the quality of testing, indeed for hepatitis C to test the need and needed an antibody test and a follow-up PCR or RNA test. So the concern here is that there is repeated antibody tests and flipping people into that second confirmatory test may not happen to the extent that we would wish. So this uh, study by Snow showing that the majority of people live with hep C antibodies in Victoria had not received the appropriate secondary diagnostic services as at the end of 2012. So that gives us cause to um, think about what is testing, how is it delivered, and are we achieving the complete range of tests that we should? Why isn't testing? Testing is high, but why isn't it complete? Why isn't 100% of people receiving that second test? Who is not getting tested and why? And this is where we start to pull out data from the qualitative project that we've been conducted recently. And one of the issues to highlight from that data is the notion of getting access to veins. So this is a long quote, but it really pulls out some terrific issues. So our interviewer, Annie, asked, so you mentioned that your thinking around hep C treatment has shifted. So you're not on treatment, but you're thinking about the possibility of it. And the person says, I am, and I actually went to have a real good go, and they couldn't get blood out of me. So is that the main barrier for you? Yep. And how do you think that's being handled, the health professionals you're seeing? I mean, they're cool. They say they get it. They understand it, but they don't really kind of understand. I don't feel they really do understand it because, you know, they just say, well, you whack up, don't you? You don't, and they don't really understand the difficulty I have actually whacking up or injecting. And uh, the interviewer says, so, and putting something in, it's not the same as getting something out in terms of blood. And the person says, yep, like every now and again you hear, oh, there's a good nurse at, at such and such, let's go there and get her to have a go. But I just don't want to sit there and be pin cushioned by people having repeated attempts to withdraw blood. And their interviewer finishes saying, you see, so you've had thoughts about how you might get past this particular barrier. And um, this person, you know, quite across the, the information around Hep C said, I've read perhaps about dry blood spot PCRs in the future, which is where a finger stick, a finger prick is taken. So it's not the requirement to draw intravenous, draw, intravenous blood. And there might be, uh, and then the person goes and say, I, I don't think it's going to be as easy. Oh, we're, we're 12 months down the track now. We can just do a, a PCR or the secondary test. I'm not saying you won't be able to do a PCR, but all the other stuff that's needed for hepatitis C tests and monitoring, which does require venous blood, they're still concerned about getting blood for those types of tests. And this was not a one-off in this project. This was mentioned by a number of people about this is a particular barrier. So they're attending services, trying to have their blood withdrawn and not being able to achieve that and therefore not moving into the cascade of diagnosis, testing and cure. <coughs> this is another participant on that same issue. The big barrier for me is no one can get blood. So I've got no veins and this has been a problem for the last 10 or so years any sort of medical situation. It's impossible for me to give blood. And I guess that's what partly sort of sharpened my perception of just how underrated and undervalued the whole issue of testing has been within the new treatment discussions. It really is, hasn't been identified as a key component of treatment. I mean, we're talking about a community of people with veins that have been used often for many, many years. So they're going to be compromised at best and damaged in many cases. And there's no alternative. It's not that there's even one specialist clinic where it's known there are really clever phlebotomists on the site. So testing is high. We have issues of access for people getting bloods, but also we can see um, 
gaps in knowledge and lack of referral to treatment. So this data is a little bit old, but comes from a study of people with recently diagnosed hepatitis C. So we asked them what happened at diagnosis. And this person, Andrew, saying, oh, the doctor didn't say anything except that I have hep C. And they didn't explain to me anything about it. I didn't even get R. I didn't get anything. I asked, do I need to change my diet or anything? And I was told, no, nothing I could do. So, you know, we hope this situation has moved on in the last um, seven years. But do we know this? We're not measuring it. We're not measuring that conversion rate and the reasons for the barriers at the uh, health provider point of view of not providing effective referrals into treatment services, even if they don't want it or can't do it themselves. So, you know, if we think about the effect on clients' decisions and behaviours, and again reflecting on that cascade picture, people may not be aware of treatment, they may be fearful of venous access, they may not be aware that there is a need for a second test, and not aware of how to get to treatment, even if all those things do line up. So some possible responses here is to ensure that there are completed blood tests. And we see some good literature from the US where two uh, lots of blood are taken in the one sitting so people don't have to return for a second blood test if the first one is positive. This study in the US with uh, veterans went from a 40% completion rate to a 100% completion rate in six months by implementing that simple change. We need <coughs> to think about how we can provide better information and referral at testing. We need some better data and some better support around peer educators and peer support. And we need to think about new technologies. Jason's in the audience today talk, uh, with publishing around point of care RNA tests, like the finger prick blood, which takes capillary blood and not venous blood. And then we need to promote those and tell people that those options are available to them so they do feel they have a place to go. We might also need to think about allowing people to draw their own blood for blood tests for people with really difficult to access veins. Other popular possible responses, how do we connect with care from testing to treatment? So what kind of development of pathways exist? Are there on-site assessment and treatment programs and are there peer delivered and supported programs? So a new update on that today, we were just talking about the new national drug strategy. Alcohol and drug treatment services are a key place to focus efforts for hepatitis C treatment. But the hepatitis C strategy is not one of the strategies referred to in the national drug strategy. So at the highest levels, we see a complete disconnect between how we might do things and what our national strategies are directing us to do. So the development of pathways are blocked at that highest, most instrumental level. What other treatment delivery systems can we think about? Hepatitis C treatment up until recently has been held mostly in specialist services within hospital sites. So where could we work outside specialist services? And there's already a range of activity going on here at GPs, at needle and syringe programs, at drug and alcohol services, as I mentioned, within prisons and within homelessness services. And again, there's activity in each of these at kind of pilot or demonstration level. So how do we learn what to do to explode those to full scale up. So th another question we wanted to ask, will our DAAs cure the cascade? We just need to sit back and thank you Jason for shaking your head, that's exactly the answer. No, they will not cure the cascade. We really need additional efforts. So treatment is low currently, we saw those great rates from uh, 2016, but our um, team, Lauren Brenner leading this, has published um, ideas that as the other barriers to hepatitis C treatment fall away, as efficacy goes higher and side effects go lower, the issue of stigma and discrimination becomes even more salient as a barrier for treatment if those uh, biomedical issues are taken care of. So in our, in our work, we see this again, you know, still just this data collected at the beginning of this year. My mum treats me like I've got AIDS. The other day she bought a juice and I wanted to have a taste. And she said, no, because I might catch your hep C. And she's even got herself immunised against it, so she doesn't get it from me, she's paranoid. There is no immunisation for hepatitis C, so we have a knowledge gap, uh, which might be perpetuated through the family system that has resulted in this kind of response to this participant. And, you know, it's not just the person, it's their full range of social contacts. So our second quote here, I don't tell anyone. I still don't tell anyone. I don't disclose, never. Even the dentist, I leave it blank discrimination. Not for me, for my kids. It's for them. I don't want them being judged because of my mistakes. 
So this is a very salient fear for people existing in the community. Decisions about treatment. If someone knows what treatment is and where and how to get it, what else might be important to consider? When to get treatment. We have some uh, data from our work and from others that people might think to wait until that perfect moment, particularly when people are no longer injecting drugs. The corollary being that there's no point getting hepatitis C treatment while I'm still using injecting drugs. <coughs> this might be grounded around fears of risk of reinfection and possible future treatments, getting access to those and also confusion about eligibility whilst using. There are no restrictions in Australia about who's eligible on the basis of uh, current injecting drug use, but that message may not be out there. We're not measuring it. We don't know. So what else to consider beyond the cure? And this is where we got, start to talk about the patient reported outcome measure. So the data I've been touching on comes from our current study where we've recruited and interviewed four groups of people who inject those who have no engagement with treatment, those who have some engagement, those who are on treatment, and those who have completed these new treatments. So we've been interviewing uh, people in each of those four groups with the view to produce a patient-reported outcome measure. And indeed, we've got so excited about this, we've reported, we've done a patient-reported experience measure too. So we have a PROM and a PREM. And we really uh, want to dig below or beyond um, the clinical and public health goals in a high promise environment. The talk of hepatitis C being able to eliminate that is so pervasive and thick in the public discourse around hepatitis C and we really wanted to get beyond that and speak to the individual, the individual's point of view. So what's beyond the cure? In the, the work we've done we asked people what are they, what are they worrying about? So the these are the kinds of things people are talking about. The physical effects of new treatments that I want to feel, I expect to feel healthier and more positive, have more energy, I'll sleep better after treatment, I'll eat better and my sex drive will return after treatment. Relational issues, I'll cope better with family and work and family relationships will improve. My future life and health, I'm doing this to protect the, my future health, I don't have to worry about hep C anymore if I have this treatment. I can move on with my life. I don't have to hide hep C anymore and my lifestyle will improve. I won't have to worry about infecting others and others won't have to worry about me. My identity will change for the better. Part of my identity will be lost following treatment and I can move on leaving that drug user label behind. And information concerns about monitoring ongoing for liver health after treatment concerns about how to avoid exposure, reinfection after treatment, monitoring reinfection and possibilities of retreatment. Stuart? Are these expectations or was this experience? Both. Because we captured people before treatment, during and after treatment, we have a lot of different points of view that we wanted to gather and put together in, an inst in a survey and try it out and see if it works. So we're going to show you part of the new instrument and then Annie will reflect on what happens when we give that draft instrument to people who've completed treatment to reflect on it. Um, in instance of time, I'm going to skip over this, but this is a terrific paper from Magdalena Harris from the UK who touches on the same kinds of themes that we found in our data too. So we need to... These data are telling us we need to think about liver disease outcomes that aren't just chronic hepatitis C. If people cure the hepatitis C, they still live with a risk of uh, liver disease for the rest of their life. So how do people want to know about that and how to manage that? And uh, this participant who'd completed treatment saying um, at the time, I don't think there's been any call for monitoring beyond the end of treatment appointment, which is called SV12. So people aren't being called back or told how to monitor their liver disease over time. And the idea of people con continuing to be at risk of reinfection or new infections. So how do we uh, support people's practice who continue to inject? What are health worker attitudes about reinfection and ongoing monitoring and support of people who continue to inject? We're not measuring that. We don't know that. Lots of gaps here. In the uh, encounter around treatment, how is retreatment discussed if people are in that situation? And what kind of support for the cost of this goes on? At the moment, people are given their 
little vial of pills with the cost of those pills, $22,000 printed on the label. When I pick up my mm. medicines, that cost isn't printed on the label. So that's a very important signal to people like, you better be careful with this because we've just paid a bucket load of money for you to have this treatment. Don't stuff it up. Mm. So how are those kinds of ideas interpreted and uh, internalised by people who might be at risk of new infections and requiring treatments uh, uh, more than once? So again, possible responses. I won't labour this. You know, providing information and referral pathways, providing education and health promotion. Another project we've done has uh, been about couples who inject. So if couples are treated or one person is treated and the other person is not, how do we support that couple to ensure that they maintain that treatment response and, and maintain a clearance of hepatitis C? And we really need to advocate for the importance of um, primary prevention that supports our investment in these uh, big expensive treatments. Through needle and syringe programs and opiate substitution treatment programs, they've been shown in lots of work around the world to support hepatitis C prevention. We need to invest in those in the community and in prison. So again, reflecting on this notion of, of justice, <coughs> we're trying to promote an understanding of the range of reasons why people engage with in treatment, the expectations of treatment and the impact of that on their lives, and negotiate this individual versus public health goals of hepatitis C treatment with a very strong discourse of eliminating hepatitis C. Of course, sustained viral response or cure is one of the optimal outcomes, but we need to think about the other outcomes that are important to people and might drive their engagement with care. And we need, again, to look to a just response where the responsibility for this is shared and not just at the um, the, the blame or the uh, put on the individual living with hepatitis C. So this is a little taster of our patient reported experience measure. But we ask people, it runs to a front and back of a A4 sheet of paper. So based on my last hep C treatment experience, I now feel that I could access treatment I wanted to. The clinic was easy for me to get to. I liked the way treatment was provided. I was well prepared to start treatment. I had enough info. There were no delays. I had enough support with ordering medications and so on. And on the PROM measure, uh, as a result of my last hep C treatment episode, I've cleared hep C. I've been good, given good info about clearing the virus. I feel my treatment has been a success. I feel confident I will remain hep C free. And down the page, I have more energy. I feel physically different. I feel healthier. I'm more active. I'm sleeping better. So all of these themes are drawn out of the interviews with participants and placed in this survey type format. What Annie's going to talk about is the um, uh, the data we got when we fed this back to focus groups of participants to ask them to reflect on the content, the questions, the um, response options, and then the overall idea of a PROM or a PREM and how it could be useful for people living with hepatitis C seeking treatment. So over to you, Annie. Mm -hmm. Okay, so as Carla has said, we um, developed those, uh, the PREM and the PROM. We originally only sort of thought about doing the PROM, uh, the outcomes focus, but in the data we collected, there was just so many possible measures for the people's experience of treatment during treatment, um, along with the sort of more outcome-based post-treatment um, outcomes that we thought we should do uh, trial both. And so um, we have done uh, three focus groups so far. There's one more next week. So we will have, by the end, done six, uh, four focus groups with six people each, um, all of whom have completed treatment with the new DAAs and all of whom are current injectors. And they're people who obviously haven't participated in the first interview phase of the project. And we asked participants to complete both measures um, and then followed the group discussion on, um, you know, just how well did they think the questions in the measures resonated with them and their individual experience, what they felt about the value of the measures, you know, any sort of things around duplication of questions and comprehension, that sort of thing anything they felt was offensive or uncomfortable and whether they thought they wanted more responses than just agree or disagree with them. Um, so I'm sure you can probably imagine where I'm going to go with that. Um, okay, so um, one of the really interesting things about it is that 
you know, because we've really gone into this genuinely unsure about whether, you know, this idea of a patient reported outcome measure, which is used in lots of other areas of medicine and stuff, whether this really would have, a, you know, utility in the space of hepatitis C. But actually the overwhelming feedback has been that people have really engaged with it. Um, it's been really sort of full discussion in the focus groups and quite active. And I mean, it's almost kind of a little bit sad, but because part of the reason people have really engaged is they've just said overwhelmingly, nobody else has kind of asked me these questions. Like that's been the overwhelming response from people um, unprompted is, you know, almost like some people actually tearing up about it, that they're going through things that nobody has asked them and they're already through treatment and out the other side. And they're things that they feel they should have been, had a discussion about. Um, and it's really allowed them to reflect back on their treatment experience and outcomes in a very honest way and in a way, as you'll see as I go through, that validates their experience of treatment. And that's a bit of an issue, actually. Um, so in terms of uh, application, participants thought that the measures could be really quite useful as a conversation starter with service providers. So um, particularly when it was discussing, because some of the issues you wouldn't have seen on the little uh, excerpt that Carla showed, there's just, you know, we have questions around reinfection and drug use and those sorts of things. And so people felt particularly on some of those issues that might be a bit more difficult to raise with service providers, um, that this could sort of prompt a bit of discussion, um, help open the door to a discussion if you like. And also, so if a service provider was doing, you know, this survey with, with a patient and also um, better for service providers to better understand the patient perspective and what matters to um, most to patients, you know, what they're seeking from treatment beyond the sort of uh, clinical expectations that the service provider might be more focused on. Um, as I said, the issue of not feeling validated and believed, um, this has come up quite a bit in the focus groups. Um, once people started really engaging with the measures and it started raising issues for them about both their experience of treatment and outcomes from it, there is a bit of a sense for those who have experienced some side effects, they feel quite that they're not taken seriously, that they're really dismissed. And part of the reason for this is people say, well, there are no side effects with these new treatments, so you can't be having them because it doesn't happen, you know, that sort of thing. Now, I guess this is really kind of caught up in that whole thing of the promise and the, that there are, you know, it's a very positive story around hepatitis C treatments in Australia at the moment, and rightfully so. But I guess it really highlights that difference between the individual journey and the sort of public health, bigger system type agenda and what that's about. And, um, People sort of say, you know, they're having said to them, well, you know, what, so, um, you know, is your hair falling out and is your skin breaking out in rashes? And they're like, well, no. And it's like, well, you know, it's not as bad as the other treatments then. And they're like, well, I didn't do the other treatments. So that's really irrelevant to me, kind of thing. I'm experiencing this and I want this, that, you know, validated. Because for some people who are sort of having, you know, ongoing headaches, not sleeping, um, lots of emotional issues coming up for them, whatever they're experiencing, they're the sort of common ones people are talking about. Sometimes days on end of not sleeping is really affecting them quite badly in their treatments. And they just don't even necessarily want them treated or anything done about it. They just want it acknowledged, you know, that they aren't crazy and um, they are experiencing these things. Um, and there is also quite a bit coming up around lack of information. And Carla has touched on this, but just on very basic issues around people saying, you know, before I start my treatment, and of course this will vary depending on who's treating the people, but, you know, people saying, you know, I, I was really just given the pills and told to go home and take them. You know, I didn't really know what I was taking, uh, that sort of thing. I don't even know what the drugs were called. Um, you know, yes, oh yeah, I did. Yes, I was told I had liver, existing liver disease, but um, no discussion with me later about what that might mean in terms of prognosis long term. I don't really know what that means. I've just finished and had my test and told I cleared it. Now, once again, this will really vary depending on who's treating people, but this is what people are, are saying. And I guess 
Oh, and I guess particularly um, one of the ones that came up in two focus groups, um, a number of people in two focus groups, was around people being very unclear about whether they're infectious ongoing. So they're getting confused around the antibody, being antibody positive for, you know, for life, but not knowing whether that means whether they can still transmit the virus to anyone. In and it is a bit complex, actually, that issue with hep C. So um, not if you're a clinician or whatever, but it is if you're um, just sort of ordinary person out there. And so that... Um, uh, people are post-treatment and they're still very concerned about that, particularly if they have children. And I think we just need to be really careful about these issues because whether or not, you know, they're a major issue or not, if they're out there and circulating, we know that one bad story can really be heard and amplified more than 100 positive ones, if you know what I mean. So I think we do need to take these issues seriously and just deal with them as they come up. Um, uh, they felt the measures could be useful. Um, but uh, there were issues around whether uh, how they would be used and whether people felt they could answer the measures honestly if they were if, if it wasn't anonymous if they were doing it with their, their service provider and um, they weren't sure whether uh, you know they could really be um, honest with that service provider about their experience of treatment and the outcomes they've got if they felt there might be punitive responses or if it involved ongoing drug use and let's say they're on opioid pharmacotherapy and so they're worried about the impact it might roll out and have for that so they thought there was some really interesting and useful stuff in there but it would depend on how it was used and um, Interestingly, people really wanted, wanted more opportunity to qualify their answers. So overwhelmingly, people don't want just agree or disagree. They at least want a scale of strongly agree, strongly disagree, not applicable. Um, people raise the you know, issue of the same, what happens when the same person answers exactly the same way to this question, but for extremely different reasons. You know, how do you get that across, you know, that context of, so they wanted to explain themselves. And this kind of comes up because there has been discussion around uh, these types of measures about whether they're too much of a blunt instrument. And um, uh, I guess what, you know, I wonder with this, whether it's because of the instrument and its limitations, or whether it's a little bit of a, a victim of the particular group of people we're looking at who gets often so few opportunities to talk to anyone about their experiences. When they do, they've got a lot to say and they often feel the need to explain themselves because they're trying, feel like they often feel like they need to justify what they've done. So I, I'm not sure how much it's, it's one or the other. Um, the other thing that's come out around sort of just approaches, if you like, to this is this whole tension between, as I touched on, the hep C elimination goals and outcomes at a population level sort of versus the individual goals and outcomes, patient goals and outcomes. So, you know, what outcome is being sought and by whom and can they coexist? Um, I think this question is really an important one, actually, because it does affect how services are designed and delivered, depending on which one of these goals you might be more focused on. So if your focus is more at that population level of hepatitis C elimination, eliminating the epidemic, your focus may be on just treating as many people as quickly as possible and achieving viral clearance. However, if you know, we need, I think, and Carla has already touched on this, to sort of ask the questions around, do these models of care that are designed to treat people as quickly as possible and as many people as possible, are they really adequate to account for people's individual and social circumstances? You know, their experience of treatment, the outcomes they're seeking from treatment that could be quite different from the goals, broader population goals. Some people might say, does that question matter? Who cares? People will get treated anyway, you know, if, if, if we've got this goal of hepatitis C elimination and universal access, most people get treated in the, in the long run and the vast majority will clear the virus. So does it matter whether their individual needs are being listened to or not? Well, the obvious answer to that is, you know, of course it does matter. And if people's individual needs are not taken into account, we can end up with people very much feeling let down by the promise of treatment. And I think we need to be really careful about that when we've got certainly large numbers of people being initially treated, but we know those are starting to plateau out already. And we know that the key, the absolute key to uh, achieving um, eliminate viral hepatitis elimination or hepatitis C elimination is 
going to be accessing current people who inject drugs. That's the key. And if we can't reach those people because we're not paying enough attention to people's experience of treatment and their expectations and the outcomes they want, then we could actually be putting up, unknowingly putting up barriers to treatment and people being um, accessed and, and getting through the, the cascade. So um, one of the things that has come up in this process around, around those issues is and the promise of treatment is there is very high expectations among a lot of people about what hep C treatment will provide for them individually. And a lot of people talking about, you know, they'll have all this new energy, they will feel so much better, they've been tired for so long, and, you know, now it's going to, they're going to feel amazing and they're going to be able to make up for lost time in life, you know. And, of course, some people do feel really great after treatment. But a lot of people don't. They don't feel any different after treatment. And some people, I've seen people who came through treatment and quite frankly, they look like they were sparkling. They, they, they came through so beautifully and they, look so, they literally look transformed from it physically as well as anything. But those same people, then that hasn't lasted and they've found themselves months down the track and they find I'm still an injecting drug user. I still live in it. I'm still criminalised. I still I'm still poor. I still live in in the world I lived in before treatment. And actually, life isn't that different. I'm still stigmatised and discriminated against. So I think these are some of the issues. We can't solve these issues necessarily, but I think we need to be aware of them. Working in this space of what people might have in their heads about the treatment, and particularly if you're a clinician, just sort of being cognisant of those individual level things that are very important to people and what their expectations are. Um, I guess to finish up, you know, hep C elimination cannot be about biological intervention alone. People have sort of made this thing about, oh, I felt a bit like it was here your pill, here's your pills and go away kind of thing, you know, and no one really uh, wanting to see me very much after that because the treatments are so great and you don't need to see anyone and we'll just test you at the end and everything will be great. But people actually do it's taken them sometimes a very long time to get to the point of going, getting treatment. Um, for me, it was over 20 years, you know, and I work, was working front line, you know, knew everything that was going on. But, you know, it takes a long time and it is a really big deal. Whether the treatments have bad side effects or not, it's a really big moment in your life and it's scary. It's really scary for people because you're scared that the treatment won't work on you and it doesn't work on some people. A minority, sure, but it doesn't. Or you're worried that it isn't going to fix all the things you hope it will, but you hope it might. So it is a big deal for people and I think we need to be aware of that so that just approaches to hep C elimination really need to take care of the basic human rights of people who inject drugs as the key group that need to be, um, you know, the front line of, of this response. And... Um, I think that if we don't go down that road of addressing the broader lives and context of drug user health, uh, then quite frankly, um, we may well see a whole lot of people who inject drugs who need to be treated won't be treated and will remain disenfranchised from the health system. And then we will continue to see hepatitis C infections ongoing. So, you know, we've got a lot of promise here and, a, and some really great tools to work with, but I think that like always, this issue of the human rights of drug users and all the other stuff that sits around that picture and being an, a current injector need to be part of our thinking. Um, it's not just this isolated, here's these great pills and they'll kind of solve everything, you know, um, which is, 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 you know, not a new story to tell. Um, we've set, talked about that before with other, other issues like HIV. So... Um, the PREM and the PROM for sure could contribute to just approaches by increasing the focus on what I sort of thought to describe as the quality of care, not just the continuity of care. So the cascade really focuses on that continuity of care from being positive to being diagnosed, to being treated, to being cured. What this says is what's the quality that sort of, you know, needs to be built in that picture all around. I think that might be us. And that's our contact. And just for those of you who don't know, Carla and I do a podcast, Speak Easy. And we encourage you to tune in because we've got a special World Hepatitis Day edition going to air this evening or whatever with Jason uh, Greebly. So um, tune in to that and subscribe and you'll hear more about this project as time moves on. I guess, do you want to say anything further? Um, just to say that the model we're working from with this method was... Um, 
uh, lent to us by our great colleague Jo Neal at King's College London and she produced a prom for people in addiction recovery treatment services as they're called in the UK and she worked very closely with this um, service users research group which is a group of 10 or so people who use um, addiction treatment services in the UK and they participated in the same kinds of things that we've been working together to use qualitative research to produce a, measure, a draft measure to seek feedback and to produce a final measure. And that, that treatment measure in the UK is used very interactively within clinics. So clients and their therapeutic workers sit down and use that, in, use that measure together. Um, so it covers things like sleeping and social relationships and managing money, not at all about drug use actually. And people can say, well, this week my sleeping has been really poor. What can I do about that? Or, or I've, I've mended some relationships with my family and I'm feeling really positive about that. So that's the kind of model we were thinking about, but as Annie said, the focus group data threw up some questions for us about whether or not the PREM and the PROM we've been developing could be used in that context because people are worried about discussing things like parenting with a hep C treatment provider in case it comes back and bites them later mm -hmm. if that information is disclosed to other services who would worry about someone who uses drugs being a parent. So there are, the method was terrific to pick up and apply, but I think we've got some other things to consider in, in our context. Actually, on that, that note, just um, very quickly to finish, um, on the uses of the PROM, uh, when I, um, as a dependent drug user, I actually did Joe's um, PROM on, on uh, the drug use one that she's done, and actually in doing it, it was so uplifting to do it. Like, I felt really empowered by it when I did it, and it was just for me. I wasn't giving it to anyone. I wasn't doing it with a provider. I was just going, oh, actually, I'm doing all right, you know, like, I, and I could be honest because I was just doing it with me. And it made me, when I, when I was doing the focus testing with the, the group for this, for the Hep C one, um, people were saying something, similar things around, even if it didn't sort of, if they were just doing it for themselves, they felt like it made them reflect more deeply on their treatment experience and the outcomes from it. And for some in a really positive way, they actually had a really positive experience of hep C treatment and its outcome. And it actually made them realize that much more than they had before ever really thought about it. And they would tell other people that. So I thought that was an interesting uh, message as well in terms of promoting hep C treatment to other. Thank you very much.